Yesterday marked the thousandth, a thousand, a thousandth anniversary of the daring capture of Beersheba by Australian troops during World War I. The charge of the Anzac Light Horse on the 31st of October 1917 set the stage for the Allied victory in the region and ultimately paved the way for the creation of the modern State of Israel. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was an honoured guest at the ceremony in Israel in which the famous charge was reenacted. To reflect on this important connection between our Australian and Jewish identities, we are honoured to welcome Dr Howard Goldenberg to address us. Dr Goldenberg has spent decades working as a doctor in remote Aboriginal communities and with detained asylum seekers. He is also acclaimed author whose work touches on his Jewish and Australian identities. He is also a close close friend of the college, so please welcome Dr Goldenberg. A long time ago, I used to go to this school. There was a time before that when there was no school here. There was a time when this land had seen no Jewish people, in fact, no white fellows at all. But this place, this place, as I know you know, was not empty. The land was peopled. And this place, this land, this very spot, was sacred to its first owners. And those owners are still, are still here, and this place remains sacred. It is sacred to its owners in much the same way as we hold Israel holy. It's right that I acknowledge the traditional owners and their elders. They are the first peoples, and we are the newcomers. The first white fellows settled in Victoria in 1830. In the 1840s and 1850s, my family arrived here. In Aboriginal time, that's scarcely an eye blink ago. Most Jewish people arrived about a century after my family. We're all newcomers, all just off the boat. We all came from somewhere else. We all brought our stories and our memories from somewhere else. And who were we? The very first Jewish settlers in Australia were convicts, that is, convicted crooks. Some of our forebears were rough and unpleasant types. Those who were not convicts were soldiers, and many of them were rough and unpleasant types. But we all became Australian. How do we become Australian? Over 2,000 years ago, the prophet Jeremiah gave us an answer. He said, Drosh Shlom Ha'ir, we were going into exile. We were a shattered people. Our temple had been destroyed. We were about to disappear into the sands of history. But Yirmiyahu taught us how to become citizens. Drosh Shlom Ha'ir, seek the welfare of the community. Eight days after I was born, my Mohel declared, this little one, may he become great. Let his name be called in Israel, Tzvi Yohanatan ben Melech HaKohen. But for Australia, my parents gave me a different name. They called me Howard, a nice, Gentile name to hide my Jewishness. But our people had learned, you don't make yourself safe by hiding. Safety, such as it is, is better secured by citizenship, by friendship, by exemplary conduct. And so it was when the next generation of my family came along, the children were Rachel, Raphael, Naomi. When I was a teenager, I remember my aunt asking me to remove my kippah when we were in public. I had a job in the summer holidays in a parking lot in the city. My boss, a major donor and worker for this college, a survivor of the Shoah, asked me, did I have to wear my kippah in, in public?
I remember watching the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, Mr. Robert Menzies, at a ceremony when he opened a new wing of the school. My mother was there, but I was there, the whole community was there. My mother said, what a fine figure he looks. I thought she meant the Prime Minister. But no, Mum saw the principal of the school, Abe Fagelin, as the figure of pride. Abe Fagelin, in his kippah. A generation earlier, my mother had learned a bit about the love that crosses the interconfessional divide. I mean the line between different faiths. My mother's father was dying in his early 40s in Melbourne of cancer when my mum was a girl of 12. Mum and her sister went to Star of the Sea Presentation Convent where the nuns instructed the entire school to pray for mum's father, a Jewish man. When another Jewish girl lost a parent, the nuns searched up and down to find her a Jewish prefix so she could mourn her father according to her own faith. In later years, mum and her sister would return again and again to those nuns at times of personal crisis in their lives. My aunt went when she faced cancer. She said to her old teacher, now in her late 90s, will you light a candle for me, sister? The nun said, Doreen, if I thought it would help, I'd burn the bloody church down for you. I want to tell you three stories that have inspired me. One of the stories is well known, it's been referred to earlier this morning. The second less well known, and the last is a private story, known only within my family. The two public stories tell of people in this land who crossed the barriers that separated the races. The Hebrew word for crossing over is over, from which we derive the Hebrew word ivri, which give us, gives our language, ivrit, its name. Abraham is the first ivri, the first Hebrew. He crosses over numerous rivers, he crosses numerous cultures, and he reaches out to all. Abraham would have made a model Australian citizen. These crossing over stories are important. They recall two moments when this nation grew up. The first is the story of William Cooper, the stolen Aboriginal child who grew up and led the Aboriginals Advancement League in its protest against Kristallnacht. No government official in this country, no Gentile organisation has stood up and raised a voice against that night of mass murder, of violence, of degradation. Only the Aborigines. What business was it of theirs? Only they stood up and spoke up. We Jews have not forgotten that act of crossing over. If you look, if you inquire, you'll see everywhere Jewish Australians leading in efforts to help the first Australians. Less well known and equally rare was the conduct of members of the tiny Jewish community of Broken Hill at the turn of the 20th century. At that time, the owners of Broken Hills Mines, which were the richest silver and lead miners in the world, had decided to starve their striking workers into surrender. The strikes, known as the barrier strikes, went on for years. Most of the, those workers had come to that very remote place in that very harsh climate from homes and families far distant. They faced ruin. But the tiny Jewish community of the town recognised the suffering of the miners. Those Jews had escaped persecution in the Ukraine and in Lithuania and come to safety in Broken Hill where they opened stores. Those small Jewish business people saw the misery of the strikers and they remembered their own suffering. They extended credit to the strikers who were not starved out. Their strike was successful and Broken Hill never forgot its Jews. That much is remarkable enough. What followed was without precedent in the long history of relations between Christians and Jews. That history, as you would know, has generally been an unhappy history between Christian faiths and ours. The Jewish community had acquired land to build a shul. Looking for support from their brothers in Adelaide and Sydney and Melbourne, they appealed to the public for funds to build the shul. But in Broken Hill itself, Christian ministers of religion urged their worshippers from the pulpit in church to donate to the synagogue building fund. The shawl was built. It still stands today. 
170 years after its inauguration, 50, 50 years or more after regular service has ended. It's now a museum where the local historical society preserves every Jewish relic, every splinter of its wooden fittings. It remains a place held sacred by the Gentiles of Broken Hill. Broken Hill remembers its Jews, as we Jews remember William Cooper. These are the small acts that create a nation. The last story is a story of my family. Late in my father's long life, I took him to Ligon Street in Carlton, where he'd grown up, for a cup of coffee. After, after our cuppa, we walked to the car and we passed an elegant and expensive food provador. My father looked up and read the store's name, King and Godfrey. King and Godfrey, he said, it's changed. It used to be a local grocer's shop. It's unrecognisable. Dad's father used to shop there for groceries. Once during the Depression, when every half of every penny counted, Papa went to King and Godfrey to buy food. The grocer said, what can I get for you, Mr. Goldenberg? Papa said, four pounds of potatoes, please, and a pound of flour. The grocer weighed out the food and asked, what else, Mr. Goldenberg? That's all, Papa said. That's not sufficient, Mr. Goldenberg. Here, take some milk and some eggs. No, thank you, said Papa. Mr. Goldenberg, you've got three growing boys. Take the eggs and milk. Papa said, I'm buying what I can pay for. Mr. Godfrey said, you take what you need, Mr. Goldenberg, and you pay me when you can. 90 years later, this descendant of Papa Goldenberg, the elderly man who stands before you, finds it impossible to tell that story, that simple story, without his voice catching and choking on his tears. Why am I such a sook? I cry for simple goodness. I cry for the kindness of a Gentile man who saw my papa not as a humble refugee, not the boat person, not an uneducated foreigner speaking his broken English, not a stranger, but a proud man, a man like the grocer himself. Mr. Godfrey, crossed the barrier of religion, the gulfs of language and class, and did a small act of kindness. Mr. Godfrey is long dead, but one old Jewish man, a former student of Mount Scopus College, honors his memory. How do we start to become Australian? We can't do better than to follow the example of Abraham Avinu, Abraham, our father, in last week's Sidra, when he comes to the land and on Hashem's command, he walks its length and its breadth. He immerses himself in the land. He weds himself to the country. In the case of Australia, we who wish to become Australian need to honour the first owners and the way we might do so is by learning country. For an Aboriginal person, country is all. It is law, it is law, it is wisdom and traditional truth. We who wish to become Australian need to reach across barriers until when we look at the other, we start to see created in the image of God, our fellow. Thank you for your attention. Australia. Your words were thought provoking and inspiring. Thank you so much.